Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this virtual professional development opportunity provided by the Maine Department of Education. My name is Joe Schmidt, and I'm a social studies specialist for the state of Maine. Today, we are privileged, happy, I'm excited, to have uh, Nathan McAllister from Kansas. He is the 2010 Gilder Learman National History Teacher of the Year Award winner. Uh, he is a friend of mine through multiple professional organizations, and since I'm always wowed and impressed by what he does in an average day in his classroom, I invited him to come share with um, everybody here in Maine. I'm going to turn it over to him. Oh, the one other part, because you were kind of talking about it off camera, and I think it's relevant, is um, Nathan is also a member of the, what did you call it, your continuity of learning group? Oh, the continuous learning. Continuous test. learning. So when Maine um, made the decision, they were one of the first states to, as a state, say no more school. Um, Nathan was one of the teachers that was invited to coordinate and develop a plan for what continuous learning would look like uh, in the state of Kansas during COVID-19. So I trust that he will be an amazingly wonderful resource. So with all those wonderful things said, Nathan, please share your awesomeness with us. All right, we'll get started. And... Okay, so um, welcome everybody. I'll do introductions here in just a second. I want to hear from you because um, oddly enough, Joe said it, that I was on the continuous learning task force with the state of Kansas. And as Joe said, we were the first state to shut down. And within, I want to say three days, three days, we developed and implemented a continuous learning plan for our state. Um, <clears throat> but we'll get to that in a second. I do want to hear about uh, what's going on in Maine. So the title of the session is Why Not? Um, two of the most dangerous words for any teacher, I believe, on the planet um, and for students. You know, if a student comes to you and says, hey, can we do this? And you say, why not? That's a little bit different than if they say, I'm going to do this and why not? So I'm going to go through this and how I really jumped on board with this idea of why not, and I call it quick and dirty projects, activities, and lessons. So I want to make sure we go. So full disclosure about me. <clears throat> I've spent the majority of my teaching life at the middle school. I am currently, I just moved to high school where I teach a college US and Civil War, what else do I teach? U.S. History and Museum Studies. This is a brand new class, Museum Studies, that I just created um, this past school year. So these are some of my kids. Um, these are uh, middle schoolers that we had, uh, National History Day group, actually two groups. This is my Museum Studies class with their $21,000 grant check that they wrote this year. And then the rest of this is just various things that, that I do in my classroom. So my handle right there for Twitter, um, sometimes I'll go on a flurry of activity, the, sometimes I just play around. And then my email if you're interested, and yes, it is a hotmail, and now I'm keeping that for historical purposes. That's what I'm telling everybody. I'm gonna keep it as long as I can. So, um, hello to all of you, and I wanna, Click that off, there we go. Um, most of you I've seen the names, and please, whenever you have a question, don't, don't hesitate to interject and say, hey, I don't get this, what are you talking about? Um, I have no problems with uh, making sure that I've detailed all the information as needed. Um, I'm assuming since we're, are we all middle school? Is that correct? All middle school? So, no, no, not all middle school. Okay, so, um, what are some, and, and so if you're not middle school, um, just let me know where we're at. Are we high school or, in, or elementary or what do we have? Oh, we have somebody on the chat, I think. Oh, third. Awesome. Ninth grade. Okay. So is that Mark? World Studies? K3 Special Ed? Tech? Oh, I like that one. Grade seven. So um, help me out on um, in Maine middle school. Since the majority of you are middle school, is it? Um, 
I'm just assuming, is it Maine history? Do you do that? And then US? There is no scope and sequence. Wow. So what do you get? Maine history, medieval, and World War II. The World War II is a class in middle school. No way. That is so cool. And Native American, Native, is it Sonia? Native Americans, is that, is that a class two? I mean, like a full semester, full year? Or... Wow, oh, that, this is so awesome. Um, so Joe's telling me that uh, not at state level, districts make their own curricular decisions. Good. That's, you know, it's funny. Our state says that, but everybody follows what the state says, you know, which I think is interesting. The state says this is what you should do, but you don't have to, but everybody does it anyway. Our state changes its mind too much for us to do that. <laughs> so I, I find that fascinating. Do you, um, so are your state standards, do you have like a list of your standards, like a notebook, like this thick? Is that how yours works? Yes, okay. Well, I will tell you not to be, that you have to be jealous, but we only have five. Five standards in the whole state of Kansas. Um, and they're just big open-ended questions. So change has consequence, something like that. And then we just have to fit stuff into it. Um, so it's not very difficult, but it also presents quite a problem. Because if we don't have a, that notebook of indicators, then testing becomes a huge issue, which comes in with what I like to do in my classroom. So um, before we get to that, virtual learning, you guys, uh, and I know Joe's here, you can be honest. It, how did it go? Did, was it okay? How long, I mean, are you guys still in school, by the way? Do you, can we just chat or do you want us to chat in the yeah, box? Yeah, chat about this one, go ahead, just tell me. Um, so I'm third grade and my virtual, my remote learning has been okay, I guess. Um, I did choice boards for a low tech, no tech, and I, um, we're still in school until some district, it's all depends on the district. My district is, our last student day is June 5th. Um, but I did a lot of, uh, I did choice boards, so they all had, and I aligned it to the standards to follow the rules. Um, and it actually, they enjoyed it because it was hands-on, um, and I gave them choices of what they could do rather than like worksheets and packets. Well, yeah, and I like and that idea of choice is is huge. I think that's hugely important when you're talking about uh, this virtual learning or distance learning or whatever we're going to call it, continuous learning in Kansas. Um, June fifth. Wow, I was done last week, uh, May twentieth, and then the school that so. I teach at one school and I'm a school board member in another district. And that school was out oh, clear back in what, 17th, 15th, something like that. So a lot of schools, pretty much all the schools in Kansas are, are done at this point. So this is, you know, my first week kind of uh, playing around and here we are. So um, I don't know if Joe asked you to do this. Um, did, in, did Joe send out something for you guys to just grab some junk around your desk? No, I thought desk? we could. I lost track of that those first couple minutes when we no, were no, no. chatting. Not the deal. So this is, this is really, and I, I want to just intro this. I'll just go into it since we're, well, we're at 1216 or 116 for you. So the junk construction, this is what I do. And this is one of the, the best, quickest, activities that I've, I've stolen. I stole it from an elementary teacher because they're awesome and they love to play with stuff. And I stole it from her and adapted it to my middle school and my high school classes. So everything that I'm gonna show you, I've done with middle school and high school. And the junk construction is this. Essentially take crap, whatever you've got laying around um, in your classroom. And I'll just show you, I've got a few things here. So, I've got little bags of just goodies and just junk. This is from an old Jenga. I don't even know. It's probably like four or five Jengas. Um, I've got a whole tub here, and I can show you guys in a minute. But 
you take this junk and the instructions are pretty simple. You tell the kids, and this is what it was going to be for you guys. This is going to be a competition to build the best junk construction structure you can come up with. And what I have my students do, they each get a bag, like a gallon bag of just some junk, paper clips, tape, yarn, um, thumbtacks, whatever. You just throw it in there. Some kids get a little bit more. Some kids get a little bit less. Some kids get more of one thing, like I might give popsicle sticks to one group, a ton of them, and then give one group a bunch of yarn, and then one group maybe a bunch of tape. And I always have five, five or six, you know, five or six groups, depending on how many kids you have, that's about what you want to go with. So each group spreads around the room. I get rid of all the, just get rid of the desks, just put them all, everybody's got to be on the floor so you can just do whatever you need to. And each group that has these gown bags of stuff will separate around the room and they have certain little rules. And I tell them, first of all, I set this up and sometimes it gets me in a little bit of trouble, but I always tell them this is a huge assignment. So this is worth a lot of points or, you know, like this is their quarter grade or whatever. I don't know. I mean, I set it up to sound really, really horrible. And each group outside of one will get a substantial amount of stuff. One group, one, and this is hugely important, one group gets hardly anything. They may get one thumbtack, a half of a popsicle stick, um, I don't know, just hardly anything. And that's important because that group will represent the United States government under the Articles of Confederation. So they have barely anything. The other groups are the states, and they can trade with each other. And they can build, they can do whatever they want to, to get their little structure taken care of. And I tell them, you know, the best structure is going to win. But the federal government group, <laughs> and this is where I, they get really upset with me. I had one girl, she was so, she was shaking. She wanted to slap me so bad. They are not allowed to trade. They can only ask the other groups for materials. So here they are with nothing. And they're trying to build, and I always play it up. I walk around the classroom and tell the other, the other groups how great they're doing. And I tell the federal government group, you know, this really sucks. You guys have, you're not, you're not gonna do well. You're gonna fail this. And I let this go on for, oh, 20 minutes, let's say. And we sometimes get some really cool stuff. Kids will, it's magic what they can do with tape and some, uh, some popsicle sticks and some, yarn but they'll they'll put something together i have one that's like three feet tall i didn't think it would be possible but they made something it was a structure it was like three feet tall it's still in my room and uh and then here's this poor federal government group with squat i mean they've got like a piece of paper folded and that's their whole structure and the idea here is it's very simple the federal government under the Articles of Confederation had very limited powers and they could not, they, had, they could not compel the states to do much. And they, they grasped that concept very easily because they've done this hands-on little activity. They don't know what they were doing to start. I never tell them. And I, and, but at the end, they go through and they're like, I get it. I understand being the federal government under the Articles of Confederation isn't that awesome. Now, being a really rich state, is pretty good. So one of the, and, and I just took, took this from an elementary teacher, adapted it for the Articles Confederation, and it's amazing how easily it works. And middle schoolers, high schoolers, they all get it because once they've sat there and they fought with each other and traded and back and forth, and the poor federal government girls or guys are crying or getting mad at me and wanting to throw desks across the room because they can't get anything done, they get it too. And so it's one of my, it's, it, it's a whole lot of fun. Um, you can play around with it. You can be kind of evil um, with the kids, but uh, certainly it doesn't cost much. You can just grab some stuff, throw it together. And I use the same five gallon or the same gallon bags year in and year out and just kind of throw things together. And these are two from this year. This is the one that will start out. That, that one ended up being three feet tall when it was done. I'm still amazed at how they got that done. 
questions on that one? Anything? Concerns? All right, we'll get moving. The next one, I've, I've got several of these. The, this one is one that actually um, a National Park Service ranger and I, who works now in DC, came up with. And the idea is we've got all this green space on the National Mall on either side of the, the reflecting pool. And, and I ended my school year with this one, and I have the students create a, an RFQ um, for a modern era memorial to be placed on the National Mall. And they have a whole, it's, it's, a, it's like 10 pages of stuff they have to go through because it's, it's based off of the National Park Service. So they have to create a design and they have to um, have an argument for why these pieces. So what I usually do is take the last 20 years. If you were going to create a memorial for the last 20 years, what would you include and why? So this is very much the kids because they are going to be able to pick the things that they want that represent essentially the era that they're living in right now. And then they have to argue why they want these things. They have to have imagery, they have to have words spoken, so quotes are always good. Um, they have to design the landscaping around it, much, and I talked to them about the Vietnam Memorial, how landscaping matters. And essentially what we do is we break up into teams. So I have like five kids on each team, and they each have a little bitty piece to take care of. So one takes care of landscaping, one takes care of what words should be spoken, one, and then they all work together to figure out how this thing is gonna be designed. And it can take as long or uh, as you want. It, it can typically what I do is give kids about a week. Um, this year, because they were working virtually, I gave them a week and a half to get this done. Some chose to work on their own. Some were in pairs. Some were in three. Some were in fives. I just kind of let them go with what they wanted to do this year. But it's always cool because if you contact the uh, National Park Service that runs the mall they will actually take your submissions and then provide a little bit of feedback, which is always nice, or at least they have in the past. They didn't do it this year because we just, uh, the whole virtual thing and wasn't quite what I wanted as, as far as the time and putting the, all the little details in it. But it's a lot of fun because the kids are able to put their stamp on what they believe this, this era right now that we're living in how it should be represented. And it, it's all them. So they wanna put music, they wanna put imagery. I had one group one year um, make it a whole glass structure so you could see through it. And then the letters were black on, so when, the, when you were on the inside, you could read it um, and the light shone through and they, they'll have water features. It, it's really imagination, but reality as well. So nine times out of 10, you're gonna, everybody includes something about 9-11. That's almost a given. Um, you'll get the presidencies, a few quotes out of that, but then they'll come up with other things that just blow you away. Uh, music, poetry, that they've, that they, something that talks to them, and they'll want it included as a representation of them. Of course, TikTok now is one that they're gonna, they want a video screen of TikToks that people can, so they can understand it years from now. I don't even think it would help years from now, but well, <laughs> it's always fun to let them play around with it. So there, I see there's some chats. Is there? Oh, you start the school year early. Um, I, well, we start August 15th. I don't know when, right around then. I don't know when you guys start. I'm not sure, but um, we start, yeah, mid-August. I don't know what it's gonna be this year, <laughs> to be honest. Where we've heard anything from mid September to we may not start till January of 2021. So, um, the January of 2021 is start physically. We would start um, virtually. We'd take the whole first semester virtually and then second semester physically. That's the extreme. That's like the worst case scenario. Um, but it might happen. Yeah, I see. Yeah, light Labor Day. That's how we used to be around here. 
um, before we got air conditioning in the buildings. Oddly enough, we didn't get air conditioning in our high schools and middle schools. Um, the elementary's had it for years. I don't know why that is, but um, middle schools and high schools didn't have air conditioning up till just about 10 years ago. So we would start later because it would be so hot. And even then we would have to take what were known as heat days. It would be 110 degrees and 120 in the building and it was nasty. Questions about the modern era memorial. This one you can, it's really, there's no rules for this. Um, and I can send Joe the, the materials for it and uh, you can make it whatever you want it to be. You could adapt this for elementary, you could adapt it for middle school, high school, whatever you wanted it to be. Uh, drawings, it's, it's really, it's just one of those very flexible projects that uh, the kids really take ownership of because it's them, it's all them. They just have to justify why they're doing what they're doing. And it's amazing, I've had kids that would rather spit on my face walking down the hall uh, then talk to me that will just love this project. They may not like anything else that happens throughout the rest of the school year, but this they love because it's all they like it so much. Um, yeah, there is, yes, a lot of involvement. And it's amazing. <laughs> the, the one huge downside is when they get to arguing about what should be in there. Um, that can get kind of hairy at times. They, uh, sometimes get very, very emotionally attached to something that they believe should be in the memorial. And so you have to play referee sometimes. Nate, I do want to let you know that yes, any resources or anything you want to send along, I will build that into kind of your little package with the webinar. Um, and then I also forgot to tell you earlier, you noted the time. I do not have a hard stop at two o'clock. So if you're okay, oh, okay good. over, I don't want you to rush through. So. Okay, all right. Now, this next one is my favorite. And I'll tell you what, if you don't have a pile of this stuff in your classroom, I mean, and a pile, when I say a pile, I've got, I've probably got 30 rolls of blue, 10 of red, um, yellow, green. For, of course, that green is that frog tape. That stuff's kind of expensive. I think it's more the name brand than anything. But um, the regular old, um, it's not painters, really masking tape, but you need this stuff. And you can do, if you're talking about geography and history and mixing the two, painters tape is the way to go. And really, I hit on this idea in my Civil War class. I've now adapted it to just about any class that I, that I want to. And the way this started, is and when you're talking about battles or you're talking about um, some sort of piece of geography like let's say the Louisiana Purchase or something like that and you're talking about those boundaries it kept hitting me that on especially on a battlefield it is extremely difficult you I mean I can show a video of the battle I can show movements on a chalkboard or on a, on a uh, whiteboard. I could do all kinds of things. But when I hit, when I, when I decided to use tape, something, it was, it was amazing what happened. And, and I wanna make this very clear. You demo it, you model it, and then you let the kids play. Because this has become one of my favorites and the kids love it too, because they can take just about anything and make just about anything they want. So what I have, and right here, the one on the left, this is actually the Battle of Vicksburg. It's not finished yet, but it is the Battle of Vicksburg. So in, and what they really love is they love to take um, a Sharpie and they start marking all of, they'll start marking the units, they'll start marking the movements, they've got the river. Um, th this one I really love, if you can, if I can zoom in just a little bit, you even have, they have where cannons were placed. They found an old Vicksburg battle map that showed where the cannons were placed and the field of fire. And they started putting that in with yarn. And all this is, they took some crumpled up newspaper to make the 
the river's down below. That's what this blue one is that's making that hard turn right here. And then they crumpled up some paper, put some tape on top of it to make the, like the, the bluff that overlooks the river and where Vicksburg is. And they just start making it. What's fun about this is they have to know scale. They have to know um, positions of where, you know, where everybody's at. They have to know um, the, the distance. So they're going to get that as well. So they're, they're doing all of this because they have to when they, and I call it my tape test. Let me shrink this back down. Um, they have to argue which battle was the turning point of the Civil War. And what they have to do is map it out and then explain why. What was crucial about this based on the geography or based on the tactic or whatever it may be militarily of that battle. But they have to map it out. And I've used this also the same thing with, I had my kids map out D-Day. So they had to map out the French coast. And I didn't tell them exactly why they just mapped out the French coast. And I said, okay, if you're England or the allies, where are you going to attack? And of course, once you put in England, you have the English channel, they start picking and they, you know, the Potty Calais and then why Normandy and these kinds of things. So there's all kinds of geography that can be had with this. And of course, this is also good for the, the junk challenge or junk construction that I did earlier. So painter's tape comes in useful for a lot of things. Um, we also um, make, you know, make a lot of stuff with this is, that's not necessarily class related and getting, getting ourselves in trouble. But this one is just a lot of fun. And I, when I say I've got a lot, um, so this is, this is red and I'll just, These are my blues so far, and this has just been part of my my little uh, tub. And I'll show you the tub here in a minute. I want to get to that. And I have various sizes, so it's always good maybe to get some of the skinny stuff. Sometimes that's cheaper too, because um, some places you can find this and just like give it away for not very much because nobody uses it. But it's really good for making towns and streets and whatnot if you want to do that. So this one right here is Gettysburg, and you'll notice. They tried to put in the town with the, the uh, roads coming in. So a lot of fun with painter's tape. And this one, again, the reason painter's tape, you'll notice my room has carpet. Uh, you don't want to put duct tape down on carpet. It doesn't come up really well. You get in trouble. Um, and if you use um, duct tape on tile, um, I, I don't know how many times I've been yelled at by janitors about um, the crap I've done on the floor and how much um, mess I've made and how long I've had to stay and clean it up. So, you know, there's always the downside to some of this, but in the end, it's all good as long as the kids are having fun. So this is a really good one. And what's really nice about this also is when you do this as a geography slash history exam or test or some sort of performance, the kids are getting into it because Again, they're taking ownership and they're on the floor. They're not in, you know, necessarily reading a document like we do sometimes, but um, actually this is Antietam. I noticed the river or the creek, but um, it, it's really all about them. And when they're out of their seats and they're playing with tape and they're playing with crumpled up newspaper, it may sound silly, but they have a lot of fun with it. Okay. Uh, next one, now, this one you're gonna probably, somebody's gonna yell at me. Um, artifacts and inventions. And I typically do this one around the populist progressive era, somewhere around and then that time period, because we, if you ever, if you ever look at that time period, right around the late 1800s, early 1900s, there's a, just an explosion of inventions around the United States. I mean, all kinds of stuff, from the simple, the mundane to very complex. So I have, and these are all things in my room, I have a full shelf in my room of just old stuff. Um, and then I have other things around my room. So I have this uh, old Philco radio. It's not from that time period, but the kids don't know. Um, this is an old Brownie camera. And these are not shotgun shells, oddly enough. Uh, these are old tire pressure gauges. 
I don't know how they worked. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, an old typewriter. I've got um, an old minnow. I don't. I have no idea why I have this. It's an old minnow catcher. You throw it in the in a pond, and the minnows go in, and they can't get out. But it's made out of glass. It's all glass, and it has these two holes in it. Um, I found it. I kept it. I have a rotary telephone. Boy, you want to screw with some kids. Have them try to call on a rotary telephone. Um, they have no idea how to do that. But what I do, this is really, and I've got the, this all set up too. It's very easy. Um, I've got a sewing machine in my classroom um, and not I'm in an old one. And I have the kids come up with, and sometimes <laughs> it's so funny. So for instance, the camera, they have no idea what it is. So part of it is investigation. Go through, figure out what this thing is, what it's used for, why would it be invented, those kinds of things. What's its purpose? At the typewriter, obviously, they figure that out. However, they cannot seem to figure out how it functions. They don't understand that whole functionality of the, you know, when the thing goes up. They figure that out very quickly, but they can't figure out when it was made. So they have to figure out dates, they have to figure out manufacturing, they have to figure out, and so they'll spend, I had one kid spend a week, he would come in after school, we only spent a class period on this, but he would come in after school to play around with this typewriter. He found that the serial number is back in here. He looked it up and figured it out, and he spent day after day and started working with it, oiled it up so it would work. The only thing we need is ink, and it would be usable. Um, the Philco radio is the same thing. Obviously, it's not from the time period. Um, I don't care. Part of it's the investigation of it. Um, but it is, an, I mean, it's an original. It's from the 1940s. And, uh, but it's still, it's part of the investigation and figuring out how we search for things. That's really the beauty of this assignment is they can't just put in black box that doesn't work. So they have to figure out, they start looking at the keywords, how it functions, and they figure that out, um, and they go from there. I have a, I don't know how many of you have a potato ricer at home. Does anybody have one of those? I'll tell you what, you want to mess with a kid, tell them, and once they figure out this is a potato ricer, I have kids every year, and they'll go, so if you put a potato in here, it turns into rice. It's like, no, that's not. <laughs> They just, for the life of them, they can't imagine how this thing, anyway, that's a lot of fun. Um, and really mundane objects, just simple little things like some of these little medicine jars are a lot of fun to use. Um, and I have just, and I, and this is what I said, it might get me in trouble. This stuff doesn't, um, I didn't pay a lot for it. Most of this, I just picked up or I asked parents, I sent out an email and said, Hey, if there's anything you're going to throw away, um, bring it by and I might use it in the classroom. So most of this I've gotten for free. The typewriter I paid for, I saw it, I wanted it. Um, and I got that the Philco, nothing. I just had a parent just drop it off and said, we don't want it anymore. Cameras, all this stuff. Most of this, I've just had parents give it to me. Um, so it, it really is. Now, my, my sewing machine, that was my uh, great-grandmother. So I was able to pick that one up. And it's in, it really is, it's about the historical skills of how do we do a search? How do we, how do we identify pieces of history, what they were used for, um, and going through and acting as a historian? It's really just a quick little historical activity and them being the historian rather than me telling them what these inventions are. I have it as an investigation. I will say one thing that I would highly caution when you do this is any electronics. I have an old fan and two boys thought it would be really cool to plug it in. Um, the cord, there was a little fire. Um, I won't go into all the details, but uh, it was a lot of fun and somebody filmed it and then it got on social media and that's how I got in trouble. So they're they're sneaky. I know they are because they do it all the time. Um, but it's a lot of fun. And when you can get some kid that would rather be doing something, I don't know, illegal, 
and having fun in class with an old fan and figuring out where it came from and how it functioned and who made it and what date and all that stuff. And if they happen to plug it in and blow the cord across the room, that's fine. By the way, that fan still didn't have a cord. So that's, that's, that really is one of, one of my favorites. Um, investigating the past through artifacts. And I do have, I've even got some uh, fairly new things. I've got some old cell phones, I've got a whole bag of those. And they're, you know, you would think they wouldn't be fascinated, but they're really fascinated with the flip phone. They just think, wow, people actually use those. And I said, yes, decades ago. All right, so Joe mentioned this before we started. This is one that um, I will, it's all me, I did it. Um, this started with the idea that I wanted to demonstrate the impact and the destructive force of Civil War weaponry. In particular, the bullets that were used by Civil War soldiers, the mini ball or minier. And <laughs> well, my, I wanted to bring a shotgun to class and shoot a cow leg. Oddly enough, my principal would not let me do that. I, I, and I'm still to this day, I look back and go, man, what, how did I argue that? Because I sat there for about a half hour trying to argue that. And he, he had, it, the facial expression never changed. And he just looked at me and I, and I, I thought I was fairly convincing, but I never won. So I wanted to figure out how I could do this. And I have, and I currently have, I, I should probably go get one. I have four cow legs in my, in my freezer downstairs. Um, so what I do is I call my local butcher and we're like on a first name basis now. I just call him up and he says, how many? He already knows what I'm gonna ask for. And I get cow legs and my sledgehammer, which, oh, I wanna, I wanna zoom in a little bit. The sledgehammer that's right down there, this is your bullet. So this bullet right here is represented by this sledgehammer. It's the best I could figure out to give you, give a student the idea of what the destructive force of a Civil War 58 caliber, roughly, bullet would be like. So it's really simple. You get a cow leg, and usually it's just from, you, you don't want the hoof, that looks a little weird. Um, not that any of this is normal. And so take that cow leg, put it on the floor, hit it with the sledgehammer, and then demonstrate what it does to the bone. Typically what happens, especially, you know, you tell the kid it's like a thigh bone, because it's about the same thickness, that part of the cow leg, the lower part of the cow leg. And it splinters and cracks and stuff goes everywhere, little shards of bone. Um, and, the, uh, and then what you can do is you can talk about what the surgeons were left with. And this is the important part of this. And I, and I really try to emphasize this. You really don't have that many surgeons per 1,000 soldiers in the Civil War. There just aren't that many. And so like after the Battle of Antietam or after the Battle of Gettysburg, when you've got tens of thousands of guys that are injured, what do you do? And it really becomes this triage situation where if you have somebody with a damaged arm or splintered leg, your best option is either, well, you have two options. I won't give you your best, but you have two options essentially. Cut this person's arm or leg off and get to the next man, or work on this person hoping to save this one arm while well, how many other guys are going to die in the process waiting on you and so it becomes a it really becomes a situation of simple numbers save as many guys as you can cutting off limbs by amputation or treating this one person to hopefully save a leg or an arm and so yes i do this in my classroom I, this was, this picture is from me doing this um, for my students virtually because we couldn't meet. So I just did it out on my front patio. But normally I typically do this in the classroom itself. This, this one year with all these girls and 
these girls, they just, they wanted to do this. Um, this, that year I didn't, I couldn't get cows, but it was during deer season. So I was able to get deer legs, which are gr good, really not for leg, but they're really better for your arms. Um, but they still, I mean, they really get into it. The kids want to, um, it's, it's really, it's not about me doing this again. It's about them ownership and agency with what they're doing. So for instance, I have a whole script, um, and I don't want to say a full script. It's like a, just little hints and ideas. And then what I do is I give the kids a class period or two to create their own script, and then they do this. So each group gets a cow leg. Each group has to demonstrate it. The only thing I require is that they, one, they make sure that they're accurate. So they'll use chloroform. They'll knock the guys out because that's a big myth. They will, they talk about how the surgeons were saving lives and how many men they saved. And there's a chunk of primary sources that I use with this. And then they, they go through and they make their own script and then they demonstrate it for everybody else. So again, it's them doing this rather than just me cutting up a cow leg. Um, not, not that I don't mind, you know, I, I still think this is kind of fun. And when I was at the, my middle school, the middle schoolers would do this we had um, purchased a Civil War surgeon's tent. So they had a tent and they would throw the cow legs outside, you know, after they were done, they had a little pile thing and, oh, it was amazing. A lot of fun. I think the most I've ever ordered is 18 cow legs at once. Um, I had to use a friend's freezer too for that one because my freezer wouldn't hold them all. That, that's when you know you, you're true friends, when you ask, uh, can, I, can I borrow your freezer for cow legs? So that one's a ton of fun. Play around with it. Um, the only the only cost really, because cow legs they just usually give them to you, is uh, the surgical saws, the replica surgical saws, which you don't need, but it's always fun to have those. And um, I can't remember. You can buy them online. It's not a big deal. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. With, with the question, this 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 is awesome. Um, with these uh, situations, kind of, how do you then deal with parents and students and the rest? Because it seems like a really great out of the box thing. Uh, but bef would you recommend getting your continuing contract first, or is this something? <laughs> <laughs> oh, good, good question. You know, um, that the whole thing when you started, why not? And then I tell you, I get it. It gets me in trouble. Um, I thought, you know, you know, let's do this. Why not? And my first principal when I when I first started this, God, it was had to be 2004, 2005. It's been a long time. And I didn't I didn't really tell him what I was doing. He walked by my classroom and saw a cow leg on the floor and I missed. I missed with the sledgehammer and put this dent about this big in the in the tile. And he looks and the, the horror on his face. And I thought, oh, I'm dead. I, you know, pink slips coming. It was my first year working there. And he runs, he takes off running. He comes back and he's got a board. And I thought, what in the hell is he doing? He said, you're going to put more dents in that floor. He could have cared less what the lesson was. He was worried about the tile. So um, I knew at that point, Either this guy, who turned out one of the best principals I've ever had, he just, he really let me go. Um, and I was really worried. And you have a great question. Is it Neil? Yeah. When I went to this high school that I'm at now, which is in this classroom, I was scared to death that I was going to, you know, there was no way I was going to be able to do this. And when they offered me the job and they said, you're gonna teach a class on the Civil War, which is one of the reasons I went. I'd have a whole class on the Civil War. And I wanted to do this. And I told him, I went in and I talked to him and he said, you know what, do whatever you want as long as the kids are engaged and they're learning. Um, I have had a few kids, I always have to have a trash can around because I have had, um, and really it's the guys that puke more than the girls. But it's only been maybe four or five out of, you know, the past 16 years that I've done this. Um, I've never had one parent complain. Oh, wait a minute. I take that back. First year, 
I had a kid talk about, it. he was holding the cow leg and he had his whole surgeon gown on. And he was talking about how more men died from chlamydia than, and I thought, Oh my God. He said the right, he's, I said, where did you get chlamydia? And he, he goes, Oh, I met cholera, but his mom heard it and comes running over to me because we're at our history fair. And I'll get to that in a minute. She said, what are you teaching my boy? And that was, that was the only, <laughs> only time I, I got in trouble. And he said, I got it mixed up with my PE class, you know, and they were doing sex ed. So really that's it. Most of the time the kids have a blast. I had one boy call his mom and said, he, he, you know, I just don't want to be here for this. And that's fine with me. Um, but 90% of my kids, actually the picture of these girls right here, two of these girls aren't even in my class. They were walking by, saw that we were doing it and wanted to participate. So they jumped in with this other group of girls to, to do this. So um, yeah, it's just a lot of fun. Make sure you have a tarp if you're gonna be in your classroom. Make sure you have that board so you don't dent your tile or your floor or whatever. Um, get yourself a couple of old mini balls, which you can find those on the internet. And then find a local butcher or a grocery store that'll, you know, see if they can get you one. Nine times out of 10, they're free or they may charge you like a buck. Um, it's a lot of fun. I have the whole, the whole thing, I updated it this summer uh, because a guy in Tennessee wanted it. So I'll send that to, to Joe as well. So you'll get, you'll get the whole thing. And then let the kids play with it. Um, if they don't like part of the script and they want to put some, their own spin on it, as long as they're hitting the basic points, you're good. And they get to, you know, they're a little gory. You know, they, I've had kids, can we get surgical gloves? You think they had surgical gloves in the Civil War? No. So now you're going to grab it with your hands. And it's always funny when they're grabbing it like this. Like it's going to, it's hilarious. Okay. The... That one's probably got me in the most trouble. This next one is probably, well, probably some trouble too. Um, years ago, I had a middle schooler ask me, and this is really where this whole why not started. I wanted to tell this story. It's going to be real quick. Um, we were learning about the Underground Railroad in Kansas and a little trail called the Lane Trail. And it's where free staters would go through Nebraska to get into Kansas because Missouri was pro-slavery. There were problems. And this lane trail was also used as an underground railroad route. And one of the kids asked, he said, or she said, sorry. She said, well, where is it? Where's this lane trail now? And I said, well, it's roughly it follows this highway that's just right outside of our school. It's not very far from our school. And she asked then again, she said, well, why don't we know about this? Why don't we, why isn't it marked? And I said, I don't know. She goes, well, then why don't we do something about it? Why not us? And that little question turned into an entire seventh grade group of kids writing a piece of legislation to recognize that trail. Um, they marked a highway um, and then a piece of underground railroad. And so you had seventh graders writing legislation. They went to the state house. They testified both in the house and the Senate. They, and this turned into a big hullabaloo because the guy that it's named for is, has kind of a weird reputation in Kansas. And some of the legislators didn't want, want it to this bill to pass at all. So we ended up having to go in and meet with, this is the strangest thing, Senate leadership to compromise on our bill, to then tie it to a multi-billion dollar transportation bill and the seatbelt bill. So these kids ended up, their bill, the passage of their bill ended up being tied to this multi-billion dollar transportation plan and the seatbelt law in Kansas. And it took us the entire, well, we started working on this back in, it would have been September, no, probably October, November. And 
we we got it passed it finally passed in late may right at the end of the legislative session and then we had to fundraise because in kansas um, highway markers of this nature are paid for privately and not with public taxpayer dollars so you talk about a a, a fantastic uh, project as far as ownership and agency when you have kids that are meeting with legislators and lobbying them for the passage of a bill and making compromises, um, they know those kids that wrote that legislation um, probably know more about the legislative process because they had to do it. They had to know it. I mean, it was so funny. We would have a, on our whiteboard, we would have a map and we would have each com a picture of each committee member and we'd say, okay, can we get this guy? How many votes do we have? They're counting votes. They were seventh graders are counting votes. Okay, she's no good. She's no, she's not going to go for it. Count her off. Who's, who's the one we can turn? And that's, and this is what they were doing. It was, it was absolutely fabulous. Since then, um, I've had a group of boys that were baseball fans um, write a piece of legislation. And then just here in the last year or so, um, I had a boy in my Civil War class who found a guy that started that very underground railroad that I would, the kids back in 2009 wrote their legislation about, and they, he found the actual guy that did it. So all in all, I've had middle schoolers and high schoolers write three pieces of legislation in the state of Kansas. And um, we've got another one that the kids are wanting to pass. They want to make um, election day a state holiday. And they've been working on this one for two years now. They have been to the state house. Um, last year they went and we missed what is known as turnaround day by just a couple of days. So we weren't able to get it in. We went in this year, we had a legislator, we, we knew, um, again, they're going through the whole committee. It's, it's just fascinating and it's a lot of fun. We go in to testify, which is, there are the pictures right here. This is the one, the election day bill. We actually had a legislator on that committee tell the kids, why would we want more people to vote? He actually said that to the high school kids. So we leave that guy's office. <laughs> And I, I got to tell you, some of these high school kids, at least a couple of them on there, I have one that, you know, he's one of the top kids in Kansas. And he comes out of there and he just looks at me and he goes, what a tool. And we, we uh, had to go find another legislator. And, you know, and it didn't pass this year because um, the whole COVID-19 shut down the legislature and they just scrapped every, every bill. So we never really got beyond testimony matter of fact this testimony happened about two weeks before everything shut down so we'll try again next year it's uh, it's one of those things and i and really these pieces of legislation have all been from the kids asking the the election day bill is one they want they also have one about um medicines for kids it's something weird that Kansas does. They found it. They want to do it. So these are the things that my kids like to do. Um, and I don't really have a problem with them doing, uh, because I think it's hugely important. Okay. Other ideas I have for you. And then I'm going to get to my tub because I really want to talk about that. So middle school, especially, and you guys are, Oh my God, it, it's so amazing. You guys get to kind of do your own thing, which is, I am so envious of you. Um, I started when I was at my middle school, we started a history fair and essentially it's think of it, uh, kind of national history day, only town to, toned down a little bit. It's not, it's more hands-on and less competitive. Essentially it's the kids having fun with doing something historic and they do the research. So we had six, seventh and eighth graders. Um, the sixth graders did world history stuff, seventh graders did Kansas history, and the eighth graders did U.S. And essentially, they got to pick their project, do their research, build their project, and 
and then have fun. We had one day. So we would set the schedule. The history fair would start at 9 a.m. and then would end at noon. We would have lunch and then they would watch a movie for the afternoon while um, we cleaned up. So we had, oh my gosh, we had an Egyptian mummification um, ceremony and complete, I'm not kidding, we had the tomb and we had a sarcophagus. We made a, a, a paper mache sarcophagus, full body size sarcophagus. Um, we had a sod house, a styrofoam sod house. It was like, oh, I can't show with my hands, about two feet thick styrofoam blocks that we'd gotten. And then we cut it to make it look like old sod and thrown some grass in there, you know. So we had a sod house. We had, we had a bar for Cary Nation, you know, because we are Kansas, you got to have the whole prohibition. Um, what else did we have? Oh, we had a Great Wall of China. We had a castle. These were all styrofoam. Um, we had an immigrant buffet because nothing talks about the culture of a people better than their food. So we would have kids research an immigrant group that came to the Americas or either from Europe or from Asia or wherever, and they would do a recipe and share that culture through food. It was a lot of fun. Um, oh my gosh, we had, we had a silk road or silk road um, down a whole hallway. We'd have a whole hallway and they'd have to pay this and they get jumped by uh, bandits. We had a wagon. Um, we had a chuck wagon and we had a regular wagon and we had a gold rush. So I built a sluice box, 18 foot long sluice box. And we had a pump and kids would, we'd paint rocks, they would paint rocks and then we'd show. And the whole idea was to bring in first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth graders, they would come in to the history fair, the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, oh, and fifth, um, the fifth graders would come in. So you had first through fifth, and the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders would then teach them about these little pieces of history. So their job was to become the historian for that three hours. So that's why all their prep, all the research, all the time building, would come down to those three hours and them teaching whoever walked through that door. Kind of like what we have to do, you know, whoever walks through the door, um, they had to experience that. So they had to know what they were talking about. And again, it was primarily what they wanted. I had, um, oh, and this is where the why not got me in really big trouble. Um, I wanted to do railroads one year. So, I found a guy that worked for the Union Pacific and I, and I just popped off one day and I said, hey, um, can I get some, a section of railroad? And he said, sure, not a problem. I'll, I'll figure something out. And I thought, well, I didn't hear from him like six months later, a year later, year and a half later. All of a sudden in the summer, a boom truck from the Union Pacific shows up with 12 feet a full section, 12 feet long of railroad track and just lays it down in the front yard of the middle school. And I'm, I don't know where I was. I think I was in, um, at Gettysburg and I get this call from my superintendent. He is mad. I mean, I can feel the rage through the phone. He said, why the hell is there railroad track sitting in my front of my middle school? And, he, and I said, oh, I forgot to tell you about that. <laughs> so we had, we had to find, because those boom trucks, they can lift a lot. We didn't have anything that could lift those railroad trucks. So we had to find an excavator, some guy around town that could move and we put him somewhere and I had to get rock and make it look normal. And so we had a whole history fair project built around railroads based on the railroad track. I never thought I would get it. And it came at the wrong time and my, and my superintendent was not happy. He still complains about that. He's retired, he still complains about it. So, yeah, sometimes it's just, you just gotta ask. Um, so that's the history fair. My God, it's one of the best things I ever did as a teacher. The kids loved it every year. We would recycle stuff. I had stuff, I had, a, I had four storage cabinets in my classroom 
three of them full of clothes. So dresses, I had dresses for kids. Um, I would sometimes dress up as Carrie Nation, which that's not a pretty picture. Um, so yeah, and you just keep building it as you go. We start out with nothing and ended up, we had a cannon, I mean a real cannon. We brought a real cannon to school and these guys would shoot the cannon to start off the history fair and then shoot it off to end the history fair. Um, it was, oh my God, just one of the best things ever. Um, the Colombian Food Exchange party, that was one of my uh, college kids actually came up with this one. And they said, why don't we have a food party? And I said, okay, if you're gonna do this, we're gonna have to make it as an assignment. And so they had to come up with food items that would fit with the Colombian Exchange. So they had to prepare a food that would have gone in either direction. They had to make sure they, they identified it that way. They get bonus points if they could combine the foods in some way. So if you can take a Colombian exchange item, they said, well, can I just bring a tomato? And I said, no, no, you got to bring an, you know, a food item of some sort. Not, I mean, a prepared dish, not a, uh, not just going to bring a, a random pig and just lay it, you know, let it loose in the school. So that was, that was an easy and quick one. And of course, kids love food. So that was easy. Cannon relay race. We do a whole cannon drill. Um, had a load of cannon, a Civil War cannon. Of course, you could do this with Revolutionary War. Um, any pre, you know, any muzzle loading cannon and, and how you go back and forth. That one's super easy. Uh, colonial profiling. This is, a, this is a lot of fun. Um, the National Humanities Center has um, questions that this guy asked before he would come to the colonies. And we use those questions to build a profile of the person. So I don't give them who it is that's asking. I just give them the questions the guy was asking and say, okay, you're going to profile this person. Who is it? Are they rich? Are they poor? Is it male? Is it female? I don't give them anything. Just do some profiling. That one's easy. A lot of fun. And typically the kids get it wrong. Um, Netflix series. This is a lot of fun. Um, where you take, essentially, the kids build a Netflix series based on something historic. So we, we do the low mill girls. And so we had, uh, we'll have some kids do a whole series. They do 10. So if they had to do 10 episodes and then summarize each episode, that's what you're doing. Just those little summary pieces, like you see on Netflix before you actually watch it, you get to sign, you know, what it's about. Um, and I, and I, that one I stole, stole completely from a guy here in Kansas. And it's a lot of fun. You can do it just about, about anything. You can take this and apply it anywhere in history. So if you want to do a Netflix series on uh, the plague or um, in medieval China, or you want to take it to World War II or whatever, you could create this Netflix series. You just plug in your stuff. And sometimes the kids actually want to go and they say, can we film something to make it, you know, they have to do a trailer, which is always fun. And then history competitions, this, this is really nothing amazing. Uh, just National History Day is one I would recommend. And then Unsung Heroes competition, that's one that um, it's a lot of $6,500 if you win. Good money for the kids. All right, so my tub, I'm gonna do this real quick. So this is my tub, tub of goodies. Um, Jenga blocks, or you can just get wooden blocks. These are great. You can build stuff with them. Um, if you need glue sticks, those are always good and handy to have. Always got a bunch of those. Um, yarn. I just have yarn. Lots of yarn. Paint brushes. Always good. Paints. Um, huge. Holy cow. Just have a tub. I mean, I've got tape after tape after tape. Blocks. Paint. Tools. Um, if we need to build something, we build it. If we want to play with something, we, we dig in here and we get it and, and we go. Oh, little, the little shelf brackets that you see, these little L brackets holding up that shelf. If you get those, you can, and this is really cool, you can take a white sheet and you can uh, get a two by four put four of those around the base and put some books on them and it'll hold up that two by four 
get a sheet, a white sheet to spread across. And you're, you're thinking, wow, this is, it sounds really stupid. Um, but then you can shine a light. What we used to do is an old overhead projector and we'd shine the light onto the screen and then have the kids come in and be shadows on the screen. And we would have, um, there's two plays you can get. One is on um, the Potawatomi Trail of Death, which was the Potawatomi uh, removal story. And then one on Brown v. Board called Now Let Me Fly. And what's really cool is the kids, they don't have to see anybody because they're behind the screen and they're just a shadow. And so they can kind of read their script and you can go through and do these plays and the kids are don't have to be in front of people. You don't have to necessarily have a lot of costumes. So the shadows can really help with that. And those are a lot of fun as well. Little shadow play. Okay, I've talked way too much. So I know um, some of you are sitting there going, yeah, um, this isn't gonna work. And I agree, some of this doesn't. And what's the biggest downfall? Time, the thing that we always fight. Um, the other one is money. Like I said, some of this stuff will cost you a little money, but um, you don't have to do it all at once. Don't start um, with every, I mean, the history fairs and the surgery and all those other things that I've done, it, it didn't happen overnight. It took me, sometimes um, I would get some things donated, tape, I would, that was my school supply list, by the way, was tape. I just want tape. And of course I get weird looks for that. Um, and, and you just, you do what you can with what you've got. Um, but the positives, and of course the other one is admin. Holy cow, people like Joe, read down your neck and tell you, you can't do that. And you say, well, why not? That's all you have to say, why not? Because the, typically they can't answer. Um, and then, but the positives far outweigh, in my, my opinion, the negatives. Kids are excited about it. I always had kids, want to do a history fair, always have kids want to do the surgery. They ask about it. They want to good, and then if, and then they're willing to do the next one because you've, you've hooked them. So that's my, that's my spiel. That's my, that's me in a nutshell. Um, I don't do a, I'm kind of unconventional might be the best way of saying it. And I do, 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 do want to help you guys. So if we want to have a little Q&A and you want to throw out an idea and you want, you, we can do something, some, a little bit of building here really quick. So. Who has an idea that you would like to brainstorm, think through, work with, with Nathan and the group? Or any questions. Or any questions. Uh, this seems like a, a small one, but it's impacting my class a lot. With all the concern over security and like school shootings and whatnot, uh, I now can't basically take my kids out of the classroom unless it's like arranged and stuff long in advance. Um, but I don't know. So like, I don't know, even little things like that, if there's suggestions for how to talk to administration to leave them more open to like leaving the classroom, or do you find that that's just not really something that needs to happen for most of these things? Well, I would say most of these you could probably do in your classroom. My Canon relay I do in the hall. I just, I, essentially this is um, what I would do is act as if the whole school building is your classroom. Now let's, I wanna make this perfectly clear. Um, those of you that are, uh, well, you all teach history because history is the most important subject on the planet. So just understand, always look at it from this angle. Um, your subject is the most important and therefore everybody, you know, should kind of follow what you do. I'm, I'm saying that facetiously, but <laughs> essentially, um, I always like to see the class. If I, I take my kids down the hall and we do, that's where we do our cannon relay. Then that's what we're going to do. If we, I, I had, I used to have an old steam powered tractor. Um, for my classroom is only, it was really kind of tiny and we would have it, we'd get it started. Now that's a little dangerous cause you know, you got fire and everything, but, um, and just let it go down the hall. 
And yeah, the math teachers get mad at you, but you know, they're math and they're no fun. So just uh, really play around with things. And sometimes it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. And I know that's an old teacher, teacher adage, but uh, it's true. Sometimes that's the best thing. Um, but I agree, um, going outside is almost impossible. I mean, I can't just up and leave the building. It's just not going to happen. If I want to do that, I have to get permission. And it's, you know, it takes 10 different forms and I have to call parents and it's, it's a nightmare. But uh, you adapt as best you can with what you've got and you just go for it. And I think the kids, if you come at it from an angle of that you're wanting to help the kids, that the kid, this is going to be engaged, then it's going to engage your kids, then your principal administration probably is going to have less of a problem. They may tell you never to do it again, um, but maybe you just figure out a different way to do it. Or you say, oh God, I forgot. I didn't know I was supposed to do that. Thanks. Other, I mean, any, if there's, I don't know, medieval, world history, I saw world history, Native American, you know, you want to talk about an idea and you'd like to do something different or whatever, I'm, I'm open. Nathan, do you have any ideas? Um, let's backwards plan this, right? How do you, let's, if I were to ask you, amazing lessons, great ideas and stuff like that. And a lot of them were like, I just asked, right? Which um, I think I've heard, I've told people, I know personally and professionally a lot of times, like I think that's one of the things I've always done is I've never been afraid to ask whether it's for railroad tracks or a cannon or anything else, I guess. Um, but so beyond just that inspiration when the question hits you, how would you how would you suggest to people to think about reframing things so right now it's like okay well let's start off with an idea how do you even start to think about if i've got uh the constitution right because you talked about uh the articles of confederation i don't want to learn it that way so if i'm if i'm starting with whatever the topic is how do you go about even starting to take some of those first steps no, no, no. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm going to say I'm going to say this phrase, and some of you are going to look at, have strange looks on your faces, and I can't see everybody, so this will, won't be as funny for me. Um, one of the things, and I've always done this, is, and it's an easy little saying, and you'll remember it now, is eat your own dog food. Yeah, and you probably what in the hell does that mean? Um, a friend of mine years ago said, whatever you do, and Joe, Joe is exactly right. I always try to work backwards. Where do I want the kids to be when we're done with this? And if, I, if that's true, how do I get there? But along the way, if this sucks, then it's gonna, it doesn't matter what you do. So one of the things I always do when I approach something, like you brought up the Constitution, if I want to do the Bill of Rights or whatever it is, I've got to eat my own dog food. In other words, I've got to take myself through this and figure out, does one, does this work? And two, is this boring as all get out and nobody's going to get it? So in essence, I'm my own patient and I'm always, or sometimes I use my own kids and experiment on them. But um, yeah, the, the first thing I do is I, and, and I always start with that, begin with the end in mind and how do we get there and does it make sense? and step by step by step and planning and and sometimes it takes a little work and it doesn't always work out the first time and you know what i've had stuff blow up in my face in my classroom not literally but um and they'll say they'll look at me and they'll go this this is not good and um and sometimes you just gotta go well okay this didn't work um or how do we make it better and things like that that colonial profiling when I started with those questions, I had this brilliant idea that I was going to give them these questions and they were just going to say, look, look what this guy's asking. But they didn't do that. They, 
I had kids starting to answer the questions because they thought this was like a test or something. And so I couldn't just give it to them. I had to figure out, okay, how do I ask this question in a certain way? So if I'm in the constitution and I want them to understand, say the bill of rights, what I might do is lie and say, Hey, and did you hear that uh, the government wants to do this? They want to make it to where, and I'm telling you, middle schoolers bite on this better than anybody because they'll believe anything. Um, you know, your rights are going to be limited or suspended and they'll go off. Some of them will get mad enough. They'll just want to leave the classroom right then and go call, call somebody and call their parents or whatever. So I love to do stuff like that, set them up and make it personal. That's one of the big things. If, if it's personal for them, if it's something that they feel like it's going to affect me, because remember, these are middle school and high schoolers. Typically, it's all about them anyway. Um, so if you can get it to where it's at that level, then they jump in and they'll say, you know what, I'm going to fight this. I'm going to figure out how to fight this. And so I'll give them a little scenario or something like that. I do this a lot with the First Amendment. Holy cow. You talk about kids getting ticked off. You tell them that they're going to lose their right to free speech and they can't do this and they can't do that. Um, and you make up some scenario that the government's done this. You've got them. You got them hooked and then you just play it out a little while. And <laughs> I've done this before. And by the end of the hour, the kids are just fuming mad. And then when I tell them I just made it up, then, then I get a little, I mean, they get mad at me too, but that's all right. So, you know, you could, you know, stuff like that. Um, but I think the more, and, and this is just me, and Joe can correct me if I'm wrong, but the more that I see that kids take ownership in what they're doing and the, the more they're willing to go that extra mile for you. Um, I've, I've, I've worked with a lot of teachers and those that uh, are hell bent on doing it their way and only their way. Sometimes, sometimes it works. Don't get me wrong. There's some really good stuff out there and sometimes it doesn't and the kids don't, don't want to do it or you'll get a few kids that want it and, a, and the rest of the class doesn't. So giving them options is, and I know it was, uh, was it Jess that was talking about, you know, or Jen, um, choice. And those are always important. Those kids that did that legislation, they did it because they wanted to, not because I told them they had to. I see, is there a chat? Oh, yeah. And Nathan, I would definitely agree. I'm sure most of these people, um, especially if they've done sessions with me, one of the things I always talk about is voice and choice. And not only because it rhymes and it's fun to say, but it actually works. And how do you approach your work in a way that students have a voice in what they want to learn about and then has choices available into how they want to show that piece? Because I think you hit the nail right on the head, right? You can tell them all sorts of different things, but if you can give them ownership in that learning piece, um, and I always talk about trying to find that line about how much content you actually need. And I use the Civil War, which you've talked about a lot. I use the Civil War a lot as an example. Like if you're gonna teach it for three weeks or four weeks, you know, like at what point, how many battles or generals or something yeah. like, is a tipping point? And can you take away three days of you talking and turn it into something where the kids are asking questions or doing, um, you know, it's that I like to talk about if they can find what they're interested in. And I always say like animals, right? Okay, well go learn what the horse, you know, what the role of horses in the civil war or guns, you know, and they have different, you know, and you give them the option to go learn. They'll learn more about the civil war trying to figure out their one topic than they would have ever learned sitting through you trying to spoon feed that back to them. Yeah, one of, uh, one of the ones that, um, I, I think food is a big one. Um, for whatever reason, middle schoolers and high schoolers, um, if you can somehow center it around food and they're gonna get to eat something or make something, um, boy, they, they just, they, I don't wanna, you know, they eat that up. Um, 
but we we've done a lot of stuff with uh we did a we we did a lewis and clark and this thing it did not go well uh lewis and clark uh food party so we found i don't even know where you find it anymore a lewis and clark basically cookbook somebody had taken all the stuff that they'd eaten and so i gave each kid picked a recipe and then they had to bring it in <laughs> Oh my gosh, there was some really horrid stuff. So, um, portable soup was one of the ones that Lewis and Clark had. Essentially, it was this really nasty beef broth, and it was god awful. Um, there was one that was rabbit, and this kid actually went out and hunted and got a rabbit and cooked it. Um, you know, it's 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 really kind of a miracle that I kept my job after that one, because there's a good chance that somebody was going to be poisoned from some of the dandelion tea. Oh my, are you kidding me? That was not one of my more brilliant moves, but I'll tell you what, the kids loved it. So things like that. I think those things, I tell you, if you can, if they play dress up, they can eat something, they can get their hands dirty. They, they love it. It's interesting you had the Columbian Exchange one. Um, because some of my favorite, I used to teach AP European history, right? And you think that like there's this curricular piece, there's all the stuff you have to stick to, to you know, keep moving things along. And we had a Columbian exchange day where half the class was, you know, Europe and half customer, and they had to go find those recipes, right? Like what are the, what were the food and animal pieces moving back and forth and what was that impact? And, um, you know, and sometimes I don't want to say it was what, how they learned the wrong things. We did the Congress of Vienna, mm. with, you know, and went through, right? And the map that they drew post Napoleon was not even close at all to what actually happened. But in the process of being those people exploring and drawing the map, Right, they had a new capital. I remember Metternich they had a new country, Metternich with a capital. Right, they had rallied together. They changed Europe, for, but they knew the entire map pre and post Napoleon because they had to work right. through it. Because they were so interested in making up something that wasn't even true, they had to learn the first part of it first. Yeah, yeah. And uh, when I I taught world history for oh my gosh, only two years, but. One of the things we did, they, we talked about archaeology at the beginning of world history, and we talked about the layering and all that. So stupid me went out and got soil and ash and sand, and I took five-gallon buckets, and I layered this stuff, and I found old vegetables. I mean, this was so gross. Old vegetables, and I put them down at the bottom layer, and then uh, just old pieces of whatnot. And so they had to go through, and they had to I had little sifters made. And they would go through and then they would try to figure out, okay, what's going on? And they have to date it and all this stuff. But you talk about a mess. Oh my goodness. There was dirt everywhere. Um, Cause I couldn't go outside. And I got so, oh my, so much trouble with that one. Thank God I had a tile floor at that time. But just, you know, playing around with stuff like that. We found, we, <laughs> we tried to make one year the, who was it? The, the, the floating gardens at Tenochtitlan. Is that right? Yeah. Little floating gardens. I so I brought in a little kiddie pool. <laughs> that was that was horrible. The kids had fun. There was water everywhere, but you know it didn't go well. It's uh, and I think that's the biggest thing. You just got to play around. You got to try, and um, and, you know this is what am I? Twenty four years of teaching, and there's always something. You can always steal some idea from somebody out there and make it your own because every I, i'm i haven't been to your classrooms but if you're here and you're doing this on your own time um it's because you're a great teacher so and just yeah, i think that's the most important thing is you're the expert in your room get out there and play around with what you've got and ask people like joe said never hurts to ask they always do is tell you no and have fun and have fun with the kids. And history is not supposed to be, in my opinion, it's not supposed to be this thing. This is, this is, this is horrible. This is my great grandmother's history book. Um, her grade cards in here, by the way. And I would, 
and I show the kids this at the beginning of the year. We do a history boot camp at the beginning of the year. And uh, because I, I talk about how history has changed, the teaching of history. And I show them this thing, and it's got awful. And it's just horrible. But, uh, yeah, I just, I think about, I come at it, and you talked about this earlier. If I don't want to do it, and I think it's boring, I can't imagine what a teenager would be going through. Because I, you know, I'm a, as my one principal called me, I'm an unmedicated ADHD tornado. And uh, I, I just can't, I can't do it. I can't sit still that long and just I wait. I've seen your history boot camp or one of your colleagues uh, on Twitter, because you guys had a virtual PD somewhere in there, correct? Is that something you'd be willing to share? Yeah, the boot camp, um, I've got, it, I have the boot camp that I have. Jill Weber is the one you're talking about. She has the middle school boot camp. I created, I took her ideas and I created this one for the college level kids for my college class. And it's, it's amazing. Um, Jill is brilliant and we've worked together on a lot of things. And so I took what she started with the middle school and then brought it to my high school and I tweaked it a little bit because well, it's, it's gotta be me. I don't want to, I can't do what Jill does. Um, cause I'm not Jill. And, but that history boot camp is a lot of fun. It's all based around historical skills. And one of the ones that absolutely gets the kids, um, fired up is the idea that when you're doing historical research, you have to let the evidence lead you period. You can't, you can't force the narrative. And I'm going to say this, there's only what, how many of us, are there six or seven of us? Okay. So there's a book, uh, it's Revolutionary Summer by Joe Ellis. Do you guys know that book? Do you know that book? I'm sorry, I was, I was did you, do you need me to pause the recording? Is that why you were asking who is in the room? Oh yeah, you might need to do that. Should, should we do the official thank you and then move on? Yeah, we should, we should, because this is going to, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, you might need to trim that. <laughs> On behalf of every, I don't have that type of editing skills. <laughs> I was trying to talk and I was not, hold on. Let me. All right, so a couple technical difficulties there. <laughs> we will uh, say our official thank you to Nathan uh, for joining us and for everybody who's continued. Uh, we are 30 minutes over time and we still have quite the audience here. Um, so be respectful of time. Thank you, Nathan, for sharing your expertise, your brilliance, your passion, your enthusiasm. Um, I don't think any of those are understated. So on behalf of everybody, thank you for sharing your time. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.